Well, both my um, parents uh, are from Brittany, uh, going back centuries. Um, certainly my father's family it goes back at least 500 years of the same area of Brittany called Côte du Nord. Um, and uh, my mother is from the Camaret Finistère, which is a very, very wild coast of Brittany, which is, I suppose, the closest be the wild, you know, the wild coast of, of Ireland. Um, and uh, as, as people in Brittany would say, she, uh, that she's a real Finisterian woman. <laughs> so uh, that, that's my background. And they, um, they came to Ireland uh, uh, in the late 40s before I was born. There were already three siblings uh, who had been born in Brittany and um, built, went, ended up in the long story, but ended up in the west of Ireland. And um, my f and they were living in a little cottage, and my father started building a house, which, as his the local builder said to me, he drew the plans on the back of an envelope like a mouse had drawn it. And that's that's the house that I was born into, <laughs> which was built uh, completely from plans on the back of an envelope. Um, and uh, so that's my background, and that's that was way out on the extreme west coast of Connemara. It's called Ockersbeg Peninsula, uh, and it is a peninsula. Um, it's very, very exposed to the elements, and um, that was my formation. And, and I guess uh, one of the reasons I'm here tonight, I suppose, is is you know I, the the power of the power of place and the power of the wilderness, um, because the Kolyak has so many different interpretations and forms. She is an archetype, so archetypes. We we relate to them in our in the way that is right for us, you know. Um, but for me, she's always been uh, very much the the goddess of the wilderness, um, and um, and you know, and and the and the ruler of the stormy seas, <laughs> and the dweller in a cave, and all of those things. So um, uh, yeah. So so I guess I'm very happy to be tonight's Kolyuk. <laughs> My big relationship was with with nature that was my relationship much more than with family it was it was it was it was where i was it was the rocks the ocean that the endless sky um this this sense of uh that was my really intense religious experience growing up was this the power of that environment mm -hmm. um and it and we were incredibly free to to roam and wander in ways that kids no longer are sadly but, but uh yeah i would disappear and be gone all day and come back at night and nobody would have noticed yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all day. Um, um and and that, that and and there were there were not many we were the only for, foreigners or non non-local people there at the time as well so um so it was a very i was very very privileged to have that kind of childhood mm. Amazing. And also, I mean, you're known the world over now as this extraordinary actor and theatre maker and artist. Um, I, I, I mean, there's so many different ways that you make art, Alwyn, but what essentially do you think brought you in? I mean, I've heard some of the stories of how it was almost a, an accident, really, and how you ended up in theatre. But what do you think on a deeper level drew you into this world? Like, What, what, what pull did it have for you? Uh, on the most, more, the most fundamental level, uh, I suppose it's it's the only way I have of communicating with the world. I suppose um, that was my way of communicating with the world, and um, and I've and uh, I I could talk about a lot of different things that might have drew, pulled me into it, but um, I I certainly think the fact that I that I was kind of in between cultures and in between languages, and was growing up in this extraordinary part of the world, um, it was the <clears throat> The nonverbal, the experiential, were the things that um, that I felt were the true reality. <clears throat> mm. And obviously, our world becomes constructed very, very quickly by society and by language and by uh, social norms and and by by the culture that we we are brought up in. And and I always felt that this place of I suppose I suppose this kind of place of silence was um, was the reality that uh, was getting constantly cluttered over mm. and um 
so it's a bit like I felt this space needed to be created. I needed to create push. It was like pushing the sides of a. It was like pushing walls. I suppose it's like pushing the sides of 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 the reality that we live in to create an alternative reality. And so it's resisting. I I, I suppose I would say it as art is an act of resistance against a prescribed reality. Tremble, Tremble um, came about because Jessie and her curator, Tessa Giblin, uh, approached me because they were going to um, tender for the Venice Biennale. That's how you do it, you tender, you know, they, it goes out as a tender, uh, about to, to collaborate with them on this piece. And, uh, and Jessie was, you know, very clear about the idea from the very start. The manifestation of the idea changed as we went along, but the idea was um, <clears throat> to uh, basically overthrow overthrow judicial law. It was it was the, the bringing back the witch energy, this energy that we're talking about tonight. It was to bring back that energy, and um, a, a lot of it was inspired by the writings of Silvia Frederici, uh, Caliban and the Witch, which is an extraordinary book where she 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 kind of equates the suppression of that. Of that kind of Kolyuk witch energy, with with uh, the um, with the rise of capitalism and all of that sort of stuff, it was very interesting. Um, the original idea had been that because Jesse had got hold of a bit of a courthouse, the original idea was the courthouse would be turned upside down and I would be casting spells underneath it. Um, but it became it kind of deconstructed itself into lots of other things. So there were two big screens. Oh yeah, and then Jesse had a dream that she had this dream that this figure should be a giant and so i have i was this gigantic figure on these two screens doing these various things and sometimes the camera would be really close up on on the on my, on my skin on my body other times i would be talking directly to the audience um i even quoted some of i spoke some of them um, lines that were uh spoken by some of the witches that were condemned um and one by temperance lloyd actually who was a devon witch i think and she i used to, bent down to to the people who were all gathered and this is towards the end of the cycle and say did i disturb you good people i hopes i disturb you i hopes i disturb you enough to see this your house in ruins all about you she actually said that so i used to say that so that was part of the piece, uh, wow. but it was an extraordinary piece. It was the whole the whole thing was like a ritual. And there were four invigilators there every day, and they did this whole ritual every day. They would pull these curtains around, and they were like kind of witches themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, and the piece um, developed and changed as it went along. I think the showing in the project was one of the most powerful. Actually, it was really really wonderful because it was the whole theater space that was taken over. And you entered and you were in this absolute darkness. You didn't know where you were. And then these things would start to happen. You know, the projections would start to come up and there'd be light on this. And at one point, the invigilators, this was specifically for the project. Jesse had this idea of um, the invigilators drinking from a tap as part of the whole ritual. It was a really powerful moment. She, she went to a, a, a seer to find out what kind of, um, and a healer to find out what kind of water she should have in the tank. So she, it was a mix of water from different holy wells and things. That level of deep, that's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Wow. I have, um, I have one other question. I could talk to you all night. I feel like we're only warming up, but I'm, I'm aware of, of our time tonight as well. But I, I have a quote from you, Alwyn, because I'm thinking of these characters that you've played and how you prepare internally. And I know how deeply you work with the territory of the body. Um, and you're, I'm, I'm curious about your own rituals, but before you answer so that's what I'd like you to speak into. I want to read a quote from you that I think is really powerful that I discovered last week, which is, I'm attracted to these roles that allow the freedom to transcend everyday reality. To me, that's what the theater is there for. I never think in terms of character, but only in terms of energies or forces that work through us. Anything can be embodied in the theater. It gives us the liberty to play. 
When I'm preparing for a role like this, I'm dependent on strong internal forces and internalized energy that goes beyond a particular acting method and beyond emotion. Can you say a little bit to that, Alwyn? It's kind of like trying to carve that space where, where you, it's, it's the zone, creating the zone, really. And it's, it's not always easy to work out how to prepare for it and how to find that zone. But, um, but definitely with the River Run, as I was talking about, I, I used to go in to the theatre. I always got, wherever I was on tour, I would say I have to get to the theatre at four o'clock, have to be there. So I'll go to the theatre at four o'clock if the show was at eight. And um, I would do a long, an hour and a half, maybe two hours of body work. It would be yoga based, um, but very deep and in, very internal. Um, and quite, you know, quite, I suppose, demanding enough physically as well, which would just kind of, it, would, it was like, it was like peeling back the layers, you know, peel back all the layers, open up all the meridians, everything. And then, um, and then sometimes I would just sleep or sometimes, uh, I would just, you know, just have something very light to eat, like a yogurt and, and a bit of fruit. Usually that would be it. And, um, and then, um, yeah, I didn't really want to speak to anybody or anything like that. But I would put on my costume and step out on stage and then do the prep, which was the mic check and everything like that. And by then I was kind of, I was fine. I wasn't precious anymore. I was able to talk once I was back on stage. And then I would... Um, you know, I would sprinkle the state with salt, which was part of our set, you know, was, was the salt thing. So the salt spring, this, the, the, putting the salt on the stage became very much part of the ritual. Um, I always thought it was a bit like a sumo wrestler, you know, <laughs> this is one that sumo wrestlers always throw salt before they go into battle. Not that I ever felt like I was going into battle, but in some ways you are going into some kind of coliseum of some kind, I guess. Um, so that would be that prep. And, and, um, and it's really about getting to that place where you completely trust, where you can abandon, you can let go, you surrender, place of surrender, the place of surrender, basically. Mm. That's, that's the preparation. Um, it's because, terrifying. Yeah, yeah, I know. And every night it was, I always said it was a little bit like diving, you know, jumping off a cliff, not knowing whether I would be able to swim when I hit the water, if I would even hit the water. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's the only place really in, in performance is this place of surrender where you let it lead you, you follow it, you follow it. You're not driving it, you're following it, it, whatever it is.